May it please the court. Scott Arthur for the petitioner. If I may reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, petitioner requests this court accept her petition for certiorari uh, granted and quash the order under review because Mr. Raines's personal financial information is not necessary to resolve any legally cognizable issue in this case. Can you declare something up for me? Of course. Um, in the record, um, I apologize for the ignorance because uh, uh, we try to be as thorough as we can. But um, the claims, it, who's correct here? Did, did, is it correct that, um, what's the plan? Dis, uh, uh, asserted a claim for loss of support and then disclaimed it verbally in, in, a, in a deposition? Or yep. is it true that that was never asserted? It's it never, it's not in the complaint. That, it was never asserted in the complaint, Your Honor, and we clarified that it was, was not so being what asserted. Is on, what, what is the claim? The, the claim is for emotional damages, emotional uh, pain and suffering of a surviving daughter and for the loss of her father. It was, was not an allegation, was not, it was not seeking damages for loss of support. Not a support excuse me, not of loss of support and services, not of loss of net accumulations, no economic damages whatsoever have been asserted uh, by the petitioner, and that's been made known numerous occasions. In fact, does the, does the, joint, the theory that there's joint liability for a joint enterprise, would that affect the emotional distress damages that are, that are pled? Yeah, Your Honor. Tell me why not. The emotional distress damages are, are purely based on the loss of the survivors, their, her, her. But the liability is a factor in this case. And but, you have, we have a single vehicle accident, two friends are together in there, one's driving, one's sleeping. Correct. If they have a joint enterprise, they're both liable for the maintenance of the vehicle. Wouldn't the records that they seek show liability for the for joint expenses? And does that, doesn't the emotional damages pit it off, off of those uh, issues? Okay, so, so if, if the, the issue is the liability issues, the, um, that would be based on the, the, the possibility of, uh, of, of a joint venture. A joint venture or joint enterprise doctrines are, are not legally sufficient. Um, they've never been recognized as affirmative defenses. Is there any record in, in the for that as a defense to wrongful death, please? None. None whatsoever. This court has rejected the concept of a tort feeser and It seems like this is a recurring thing throughout the briefing is where the, uh, where the authority for the joint enterprise, joint venture in, in this context of the wrongful death of you know, a negligent driver who apparently fell asleep in the wheel or whatever, and the other gentleman was killed. Correct. Correct. So is that, is that the sum of your claim? <laughs> the, the, that's the, the sum of our claim. What about um, contributory? Negligence. Contributory negligence was raised as a defense, but it was never argued in support of the, of the banking records ever. The same was. Well, assuming it were, there need to be an evidentiary hearing. Say, we believe that there may be evidence that, for instance, Mr. Raines was uh, assisting in the maintenance of the vehicle, and that we were there. We were therefore looking for any records he may have of payments to rep repair shops. And that, would, repair. That, would, and that would. Not to make the appellees argument for them, but they're sure the council that would, uh, but that would uh, reveal whether what type of negligence on the part of the, of the plan to see well, how would that. Well, it's tenuous. I, I mean, so, but there needed to be an evidentiary hearing. There needed to be an evidentiary hearing saying we have evidence of breakdown. Well, so why, why do we need an evidentiary hearing? Let's just say, like, well, we want to know, we want all the financial information. And they could say, here's how it relates to our contributory negligence uh, claim. Because which is, you know, he didn't secure the load, and somehow these documents are going to show that he had some sort of, you know, control over that. It, to, to the extent that they had a limited theory uh, based on, on the issues you just described, that would not require over eight months of every single transaction this individual made over uh, since before the truck was even purchased. And we're talking about records that, that, that predate the uh, ability of, of Mr. Bailey, the driver, to be even engaging in interstate commerce before he purchased the truck. 
Um, there were there were applications for a personal account that Mr. Raines made in 2013 and 2015 that are, that are contained in these records. They're just vastly overbroad for any discrete issue that the, the defense might later raise. Because again, they've they waived any argument that it's that it, they're relevant to comparative fault because that was never argued. Sorry, I didn't say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, they, 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 raised it, they raised it in their response in, in this court. They, they raised for the first time that these records could be potentially relevant to comparative fault, but, well, but that was never argued as precinct. One question, I don't want to interrupt your flow. Is the test for admissibility of or discoverability of, of evidence of this nature different in a pre-judgment analysis or a post-judgment? Analysis. That is one of the distinctions. And is the, is the discretion with the court greater in which instance? The discretion is greater in post-judgment proceedings. There are also the, dis the discretion. Well, it well if it's less. It, it could be. It could be more in a pre-judgment proceeding if it's going to lead to possible discovery. Correct. Admissibility. Correct. The 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 discoverability of personal finances. Are, are generally greater in post-judgment proceedings. They're generally- well, The judgment is there. Correct. And you can, you're trying to collect. Correct. But here, we might be trying to prove liability or other type of, of damages if the complaint were to be amended, for example. The, 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 the complaint does um, certainly uh, allege negligence, which, which is, you know, well, there's, there's a liability issue. Liability are, are related. Oh. Right, li liability and, and liability. Liability is is not what was argued in support of compelling the banking records. It was purely was there a joint venture, and the theory being if there was a joint venture, then any negligence of the driver would be imputed to the passenger. It was a defense. It was just the defenses, not yes. um, and part of my contributor would be North Carolina compared to Paul. C correct, and, and that would be a defense as well. And, and that, that did not. So I guess that would be a defense as well. But you you said something about not liability. The the, the 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 banking records were were never put at issue by any claim made by the estate by by the, the petitioner. Um, it was not relevant to you supporting your claim. Not correct. Relevant to the defenses, and and you point out that the only argument asserted. At trial was the defenses of, of joint uh, venture and joint enterprise, not the the, the defenses of contributory fault. Correct. Comparative. Correct. And it wasn't at trial. There were pre-trial proceedings. There were multiple hearings. I mean, trial, right? it, no, no. It's like, it, there were multiple pre-trial proceedings. There were hearings. That, that's like, of course, we have a tipsy coachman problem. Do you have a tipsy coachman problem? Tips. Well, sure. There's 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 not a problem for us for the tipsy coachman. There's a problem for the respondent because you need to have some kind of record. In order to be able to establish a tipsy coachman, um, I mean, these arguments were completely waived. Well, well, before you leave that topic, the judgment and the finding of the trial court come presumed correct, come close to the close of presumption. It says, a way to affirm that, then we're really bound to affirm that, even if it wasn't argued. So that's the fallacy of what you're asserting. We're not bound by the arguments made. Not where there's a clear departure of the requirements of law. If there's a clear if there's a clear departure of the requirements of law, in which there is three instances of that here, that the it's it's the the incorrectness is presumed, and it, the it is incumbent upon the court of appeals then to remand to the trial court to apply the correct legal standard. Now this court couldn't. So what are you saying? We should we should reverse but remand for the correct legal standard to be applied? That's our secondary argument. Our primary is. That's not even necessary because the, again, the, the sole argument that was raised in the proceedings below to compel the financial records was an affirmative defense that is invalid, that is not a recognized so the, the essential requirements of the law that were, from which there was a departure was the acknowledgement of this defense that is not a defense. That's that's the first. The second is that's the right. application of the incorrect legal standard. The, then that what what's that remind me what the application of the correct legal standard was? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, the, the the judge applies some net worth legal standard. The judge, oh, okay. you know, the judge's orders. Across the board grantings. Correct, and that's. You're trying to undo that. Correct, Your Honor, and that's. And that, that, 
Absolutely. But, that, but, but to make a distinction, though, so the records don't enter into it because they're not relevant to any defense that's cognizable. But the distinct other standard that was applied is essentially a privacy standard. Correct. Right? Privacy extends further than your protection is not only to protect your net worth, but also other things that could be contained in your business records. Absolutely, Your Honor. Absolutely. Distinct, uh, so let me ask this. So on, let's say we presume for the sake of discuss, discussion that they can, that if they were to have asserted a comparative uh, uh, negligence as a, um, but let, let's say, let, let, let's let's presume that that it actually holds water, that these records can be relevant to a comparative fault um, defense. Um, why wouldn't we uh, uh, affirm on, on the discussion? It, because it, it, the, 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 the breadth of the order was, was so overbroad that there's just, there's no possible way that every transaction Okay, but, okay, but we're on, we're on Sir Shore, right? Right. That would be irreparable harm. I mean, it's right. a fact. But how's the departure? If it, if, if, if the, the departure from the clear requirement as law is the application of the incorrect legal standard, period. Okay, but, and if that occurs, then it, then it, it then, then the, the appellate court is to remand to the trial court to apply the correct legal standard, which the legal standard is all of the financial records are privileged, are, are, are protected under the Florida Constitution, Article 1, Section 23. Okay, that, that's that's based on the network issue. Correct. But on the other issue, um, on the, the inapplicability of the defense for which the, the party seeking these records uh, believes they're relevant, the departure, I'm saying, what if we find that it holds water and that, yeah, these actually are relative to comparative fault, then that wouldn't be a departure. So the only departure, you're saying, it can be a departure because a subset of those records cannot possibly be relevant. Correct. But which kind of goes to the to the, the point that you're saying that it it's a it's sort of dovetail. So in other words, you're saying at least some of these records cannot possibly be germane to a comparative fault. Nearly all of them. I mean, honestly, the court would have to. Not all, but what if we say some? So, so if some were, then that's why the evidentiary hearing would be required. So the judge could say, okay, well, look, this this line item here could potentially relate to a payment to a, a truck shop. Arguably, that's relevant. And, and maybe a handful. I'm not saying that these records actually contain a handful. That I've, there was an in-camera inspection by the trial court. There was an in-camera inspection applying the incorrect legal standard, with and the and the trial court in that in-camera accepted the viability of an invalid defense. The court only limited to six month period. Over eight months. Okay. Over eight months of every single transaction this individual made, like through any account that he owned, all so every every, every, every deposit, every withdrawal. Every, I'm sorry. How do you put that into words and quantify what's what's appropriately discoverable and what is not? It, it, what would be quantifiable is only only that information which is necessary to resolve an issue in dispute. The the, the, the law is clear. Rappaport v. Mercantile Bank, the holding. The 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 information, constitutionally protected information must be limited to only that which is necessary to resolve okay, an issue in dispute. Protected order is still a possibility, right? Yes. I, a protected order. A protective order is a possibility, or just just the court accepting that the privilege applies to to all of financial records. The court didn't do that in the first instance. The court stated that they were merely transactions and it dismissed. Mean it's a I mean, it just means it's discoverable. If if the standard is is met for the discoverability of of constitutionally protected financial you're information, it's not relevant, but the court found there was sufficient relevancy. <laughs> The court found relevancy using an incorrect standard and an, in, and an invalid defense. And so it necessarily would be um, uh, departed for the, the, the essential you requirements want to say as well. five minutes, by the way? It's, it's five minutes, yes. You get one minute left. Six minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm asking because I didn't think I asked you to begin with. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, f f five minutes. Sorry, I got your question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, and I'm sorry. I'm confused. You have one minute to go. Okay. So <laughs> And, and, it can, and it cannot be seriously disputed, um, a judge, that, that the sole basis argued both in the proceedings below um, were, were for George Vench, one joint venture as it pertains to, to these records. In fact, in the most, br most recent briefing by the, by the respondent prior to entry of the order at issue, states, and this is Supplemental Appendix 24, 
excuse me, 75, most recently on July 6, 2023, at the hearing on this defendant's motion for in-camera inspection and motion to continue the MP, a motion for partial summary judgment hearing, this court held that the records were relevant to this defendant's joint venture affirmative defense and ordered an in-camera inspection of the records to occur. It, the, the, there's at least nine separate instances in the record where the respondent solely now you're at the five minutes. relied on just a vicious thought solely relied on the joint venture defense to the exclusion of any other in support of the records and for those reasons um the petitioner specifically requests that the whole five all right Fine. thank you please support michael sasser on behalf of the uh FLE defendant. Um, Your Honor, we believe that uh, search warrant review, uh, or search warrant in this case, should be uh, denied because the plaintiff cannot show irreparable harm. Uh, and the, the, the standard, the correct standard, uh, we believe, is whether there is uh, any relevant or compelling reason to compel the disclosure of the information at issue. And the court specifically found that uh, in this instance. And um, that uh, holding comes from English versus uh, Castleberry uh, Court for this case. Well, are, are, tell me why, in, in my way of thinking, why this is relevant when it wasn't claimed in the, as damages related to the pleadings. It's, so, so the information is relevant to uh, three defenses that were raised: joint enterprise, joint venture, and the comparative fault uh, issues. Uh, but this court has been, uh, this court rather, the lower court had been well aware of the uh, dispute. There are only two individuals in the, in the truck at the time. They both were along uh, for this over the ride, uh, over the road uh, trucking uh, venture. Uh, Mr. Raines, the uh, petitioner, the uh, decedent, had previously earlier that let's, month. Let's presume that the evidence couldn't support joint venture or joint enterprise. Sure. So, so how are they a defense to uh, the negligence action? Uh, well, the joint joint enterprise uh, uh, defense, it's it's codified also in, in the Supreme Court jury instructions from uh, 2013 uh, that, that specifically instruct a jury on, on applying the defense. Uh, but wait, it also wait, has wait, not been... Wait, in that context, is that one, is that, uh, is that in the context of the plaintiff and the defendant themselves being, or is that a third party? It, it refers to the claimant and the driver. So it, uh, it, it refers to... So what, what supports, that could support... A joint enterprise between the claimant and the, okay, the claimant and the driver. Um, but what if claimant passenger and the driver? Okay. I think the, the verbiage uh, from the, the instruction. But but moreover, and, and so to, to the question, yeah, I'm sorry. The question earlier raised uh, this: uh, the joint venture, joint uh, uh, enterprise defenses uh, have been discussed in a number of cases uh, uh, since uh, the passage of any of, of tort reform and uh, and the comparative fault statute. And while the courts have disavowed it, or disallowed it rather, uh, in cases where you've got social passengers, such as a cane where you've got two teenage girls, uh, it's inappropriate for, uh, to apply to, to a, a situation involving minors and to a social situation. Or to the third DCA case, I think it was the, uh, the long case where the, the gentleman had gone out for a whiskey tasting, again, a social. This case is entirely different. And even in those cases, the, the courts did not disavow the defense they said it's not applicable to those facts. And, and so we think in this case, the defense is applicable to, to the facts where you've got two gentlemen who are clearly uh, using this truck for commercial uh, purpose, uh, both individually uh, as well as, as collectively. They both have responsibility for the operation of maintenance and maintenance of it. They both have the responsibility for inspecting the brakes uh, for, uh, and in fact, in the case of, of Mr. Raines, who was the CDL holder, whereas my client was a permit holder, he was supposed to be actively observing his driving. And, and, and I think admittedly, and unfortunately, he was sleeping in, in the back of the time. He had started uh, that trip, uh, Mr. Raines had, earlier that day. He, had, uh, he was responsible by federal law to oversee the loading. We understand, I understand the theory um, of why it was that trip. And I also understand the theory of why that could be comparative. Fault. Sure. So uh, one of those, and I, please pardon my ignorance, one of those, if, uh, one of those two joint venture, joint enterprise, I think it's joint venture, if I'm correct, applies in a scenario in which a vicarious liability, right? Uh, it's, I, used, it's used to establish vicarious liability. 
I, that's one one way it can be used. Yes. So one of the cases in which it's used not to establish vicarious liability, but essentially as a surrogate for comparative, ne comparative negligence. I mean, is this distinct at all from comparative fault? It's, uh, well, I, I think it is because you know pure application of it would you know comparative fault is is then you're weighing the fault of the field. Yeah, so, so is this a, just a complete bar? Kind of? Well, so in other words, you're saying if it's not just a surrogate or some sort of um, Comparative negligence or comparative fault by other means, then you must be saying it's a complete bar. Well, I believe that's how the case law is. So what case is it a complete bar where a driver and his, pa and his passenger, the passenger of the state, or whatever, sues the driver or sues the driver of the state, and it's a complete bar because they were in joint environment? Right. Well, I, I, I think. Joe, I think um, Biff and Joe's pool service. Sure. And Biff and Joe are out going on a job. Biff's in the passenger seat. And Joe is drunk, wrecks the car, and Biff can't sue Joe because they both what? owned an LLC, Biff and Joe's pool. Is that right? Show me that case. I, I think that I think you might have to go back to the Florida Packers case, uh, uh, which uh, we cite. But but more recently, I think the the 2009 uh, Erickson case okay. involving the, the the father and the son on the catamaran. That that is essentially the the result in that case. Is that was in a third party issue. Uh, well, FPL was allowed to assert it. Uh, they had sued uh, FPNL for. Uh, 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 so it wasn't the son suing the dad for, uh, you know, for for his negligent operation of the camera, was it? Uh, no, it was not. So then, how does that apply? Uh, uh, how, how does that help your claim that it's relevant to some sort of, you know, per se uh, claim that bar the per se the defense that bars the claim? Right, it, 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 that doesn't. I'm sorry. So in that, in that case, it would not have barred a claim by the son against the father for being drunk and running the camera in the uh, No, I. Well, I don't know about the being drunk part. Maybe, yeah, I think I think it would. I think I, I think it would. That we would argue that it would. Well, but that's not what the case was about. Sure. No, it was not. Okay. Um, I don't before you finish. Did the trial court rule on Barusso's motion to strike both the front defenses? Uh, no, the court uh, did not. Uh, in, in, in fact, the, the motion, and, and this is where I think we we got off on, on the tangent here about how it was raised, the, the motion for summary judgment was only against joint venture, not against joint enterprise. And the motion, they referred to the most recent briefing and that we didn't bring up comparative fault. That is because the, the hearing where this all came out and was discussed was at a motion to continue. We filed a motion to continue the hearing on the summary judgment on the joint venture defense only. So everything was geared to all the argument, all the discussion there was geared to the joint venture defense. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't in-, in Is there a problem with you because the, this would be a deficient record and it would be blazing trails that even the tipsiest of coaching could not have traversed? I, I don't believe so because uh, I, I don't believe Tipsy Coachman applies in this instance because the court was well aware. There were extensive. So you're saying you can beat Tipsy Coachman because the court was well aware that you were making a claim of that these. This is comparative fault, and all of these records are really relevant they, to comparative fault. They, no, I, I think the court was well aware of the claims in this case. That specifically that uh, that. Our position was that Mr. Uh, Raines was not uh, an innocent passenger that didn't have a role in the operation, didn't have a role in the in the driving of the truck. So any evidence, whether it goes to the joint venture, joint enterprise, or comparative fault defense, it's all part of the same bag. It's a distinguishing between the jury of the the proper responsibility of the two men, uh, and and isn't it a much more attractive argument to be able to walk in and say, oh, he had no interest in the venture, he had he was just along for the ride, versus if the evidence shows, oh no, he was earning income from this. This was part of the job. He had he had an active responsibility to check the brakes and maintain this and that. He wasn't just there uh, along for the ride. So uh, the the evidence that we would obtain, arguably from this very limited set of financial documents, uh, would go to uh, to those issues. To prove so, how, so um, it would go. So I understand how the evidence would would support a joint venture or joint enterprise. How would it? If we, if we presume that there's not a, I guess, that either it doesn't have to be supported by Tipsy Coachman or that there's evidence that supports the implementation of the Tipsy Coachman doctrine, how do you address the appellant's argument that all this financial information 
um, doesn't is not relevant at all to the theory of comparative fault. How does his bank? How does you know the bank records, all the particulars of the transactions made in Mr. Raines's bank account, prove that he was that he contributed? I'm sorry, I, I mixed them up. We have North Carolina, Florida, just whatever contributed comparative. How, how does it? How does it? Uh, how is it relevant to prove the defense? We 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 can't know that. The judge knows that. She reviewed the right, records in that context. The you this have court to come up with a theory in order for us to 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 get past. If if the privacy if, right. well if if hypothetically if and again the court did this analysis the court looked at the records through that lens this well, court has looked at women I have let me interrupt this your problem with this line of questioning is you're saying the court did the analysis but it wasn't even mentioned comparative fault wasn't even mentioned so I'm asking you right now to come up with your theory of relevance to comparative fault but, but I, I get it you think yeah. we're, we presume the court did the analysis as to the, you know, the, the venture of the enterprise. Yeah, again, the court was well familiar with all the comparative issues. The, okay. the court spent an exhaustive amount of time, and I'm sure your honors have read the transcripts. The court was very diligent in its responsibilities. And so if those banking records show that he was paying for uh, repairs or that he was receiving income uh, from the business, uh, uh, that the extent to which he was involved in the business, the maintenance of the truck, the operation of the truck, all would go to comparative fault. May it also go to... Uh -huh. may, I'm sorry? How, how would his can role in maintaining the, the truck? I'm yeah. sorry? Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you explain the theory the relevance? Sure. Uh, the more that a person is involved in the safety of the truck, and the main, by the way, the, this court's not adjudicating how this accident happened, but the driver went off the side of the highway. He, he didn't fall asleep. He wasn't speeding. The truck was out of control. Evidently, the brakes weren't working because he had the wherewithal to go off the side on one of the off-road trucks. Uh, ramps. So there was, a, there was a, at a minimum, evidence of some issue with regard to the maintenance a, a, of the truck. Um, so That's any the evidence which would... Because of the speed of the truck, couldn't navigate the road and come up on the speed ramp and then those steel cylinders that were on the truck would have been spinning out of control. Right. That, that's right. And, and so that, then we get into the other issues of, of again, uh, could, you, could you, with more particularity, describe what is what 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 is potentially in the business records that prove that the decedent who was sleeping uh, was comparatively at fault? Well, again, we think that any evidence which would show his uh, active involvement in the operation is evidence that would go toward his comparative fault. So, uh, whether that is in the form of uh, payments for uh, services. Uh, uh, to the truck, whether that is in, even in the form of payments to himself. Any any evidence that shows that him as not simply a mere passenger. If he was being but, paid, um, that would turn the tide on the chair to fall. It'd, it'd be evidence of it. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it's uh, anything's conclusive. I'm saying this evidence would go to, to multiple uh, issues in the case. Because of the challenge of responsibilities? Uh, yes, yes. And, and both, both voluntary uh, uh, actions and and other legal responsibilities under either under the CFR or under uh, the Florida statute. Last question. And I hate to interrupt you, but if the trial court did not rule on the motions to strike the affirmative defenses, how can there be a clear departure of law by allowing the discovery to prove the defenses? The the court denied their summary judgment on the joint venture defense, and I'm not sorry if I'm if I'm sorry if I'm not following your. No, what I'm saying, how can there be a clear departure of the essential requirements of law if the court didn't rule on the two affirmative defenses and say they're totally irrelevant? Isn't that a factual determination? Well, I, that, that's exactly right. So the court, and I think in the first instance, the court's got to be the arbiter of that, uh, which is why, and I didn't, I didn't press the issue too much because I don't think it was an appropriate issue to press with this court, but I don't know that it's necessarily this court's role to make those determinations to strike defenses out uh, 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 entirely. Right. And, and, and so as to the essential requirements of law, again, we're talking about something that is far beyond legal error, uh, an abuse of judicial power. Let me ask you uh, this. So let, is this like, so let's say that um, the, we find that, let's say you um, asserted uh, latches or something as a defense. And then they said, well, you know, we need some judgment on this. Some this is silly, you know, latches doesn't apply. And then the court got that wrong. And then said, oh, you know, no, some of your judges deny their latches defense stands, they can still go forward with it, and they get all this discovery that proves latches that is relevant. You're saying we can't get to that 
because of the incorrect, even if we find that the motion for some denial motions for summary judgment on the defendants of latches, which is patently absurd, we can't, we cannot bootstrap that as a, um, as a departure from the essential for other crimes of law in a discovery dispute about relevant evidence because, hey, that's water on the bridge. You, you made this patently absurd, um, you know, decision to let this patently inapplicable I, I, I agree with you 100 percent there. I, I think, but, but, but I, yeah, of course. But but in your example, it's it's a patently unacceptable, clearly um, established uh, doctrine of law that that this cannot be relevant to. But, 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 but on the other hand, we're up here on the issue, right? So in other words, how, how does a how does an incorrect ruling, if we indeed agree that they the trial court incorrectly denied their motion for summary judgment on the, on the defense of vicarious about another joint venture. How does that insulate an, another incorrect ruling by allowing in uh, discovery that is relevant to a defense that is not cognizable? If we if we if we were to accept the arguments, now. but well, the, the the court's order says that that the discovery that she observed in camera, line by line, in, in meticulous detail, that it was she found that it was relevant to the claims and the defenses raised in the case, okay? So I, I, I'm not gonna read into her mind as, as to what exactly she meant by that. I, know, I do know that- talking she, about the fact that, uh, that, you, that you're saying that because that's water under the bridge that this defense was allowed in, therefore it can't possibly be a departure, but, uh, it can't possibly be a departure from the essential requirements of the law to allow discovery on a defense that's not cognizant, we find it's legally speaking not cognizable, it doesn't matter because no, I, I no, I think your honor's point is correct. I mean, if if that is your 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 ultimate finding that this discovery can only go to that defense and that that defense is not no longer recognized in Florida and to the extent it has been, it's it's and and even regardless of the factual scenario, we're saying a bright line rule. You're I, I think I think you're correct, but I don't right, think what I don't think that that's a factual departure? circumstance. Wait, I'm, just, I'm sorry. Correct that it would be a departure. No. Even though that defense had already been adjudicated incorrectly as cognizable, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not okay. sure. I, I think so I was agreeing with your with your. Yeah. Okay. So I was raising, I was playing the devil's advocate, or, but I think you uh, you decided that the devil's advocacy was correct, which is that because if we decide that it was that the adjudication of whether the a defense defense A is cognizable as to this claim. And it's been adjudicated. You're saying because it's already been adjudicated, and subsequently there's a discovery order that that is that is actually, that's premised on that defense. We can't reach that on on certiorari because it can't possibly be a departure from essential requirements of the law. Because hey, the judge said that defense is kosher, therefore you get the discovery. No, I I think and I agree with your example where if you've got a completely invalid, unrecognizable defense that is somehow made its way through and got to this court, this court would be entirely permitted to say, okay, so no, no, no. Yeah, okay. yes, yes, I did. Yeah. yeah, I was only distinguishing the facts of, of this case in this particular instance okay. um, and, and, the, and the court's specific findings in this case that the information that she saw with her own eyes was relevant to the claims and defenses uh, uh, that were uh, being litigated in the case. She didn't specify any affirmative defense. She didn't say what aspect. Uh, and maybe she would have violated some privilege if she would have disclosed too much uh, in that order and, and somehow affected this court's ability to review. The, the other thing I wanted to comment real quickly on the, on the form of the proceeding, because I'm not so sure the, the purpose of an evidentiary uh, hearing in this case is to determine the relevance of the information, of the discovery, uh, the, the banking records in this case, uh, to the issues. Uh, that's the purpose. When you look at Roe and, and why they were talking about if you conduct a, an evidentiary hearing, uh, that's what, what they're looking at, and that's exactly what the court did. She, she examined the information in relation to the claims and defenses that were before her. Secondly, uh, you know, as the, uh, I think as the, the Elser uh, case that, that I noticed, uh, that, you know, an evidentiary hearing is not, not always required. In fact, not required in, in their view uh, at, uh, at all uh, in these circumstances. Uh, so uh, we don't know that, number one, that, that she was required to conduct 
uh, an evidentiary hearing in this case. But secondly, I think I think that's exactly what she did. She looked at the evidence before her. She knew what the claims were in defenses because they had been argued ad nauseum uh, uh, on, on, during the course of a number of hearings. Uh, and, and the transcripts, transcripts will reflect that. So uh, we would respectfully request that the court uh, deny certiorari relief uh, in this matter. It's a very limited uh, number of documents, a very limited time period that we're talking about. I actually think it was six months of records. I think she might have permitted eight months, but the actual amount of documents was... What if we find that the six month scope is, is incorrect? So in other words, what if we find, we talked about, um, you know, well, not Trevor Mendel. We, we talked about the appellant that, you know, what if, what if, what if the trial court did not depart from the central rights of the law um, with regard to uh, whether a defense was cognizable to this cause of action, but some of the records are patently irrelevant because of their, their time period of the records themselves? Uh, before, you, and before you answer, you're technically out of time, but of course, I'll let you finish the answer. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think we're really only talking about a three or four month period before this accident anyway, but they did not differ differentiate. In the privilege log that was filed, they did not differentiate. A every objection was uh, was based on privacy and they did cite the Florida's constitution. So they did, there was no differentiation. They made a relevance argument. They, they, they made a relevance argument. Yeah, yes, that's true. But but the uh, the the purpose of the in camera was to evaluate their, uh, uh, you know, they submitted a privilege log at the at the request and and, uh, and that's what the, what the board was looking at. I mean, in the context of, of discoverability of the records. Thank you very much. Thank you. You got four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to address one of the most fundamental aspects of, of this. Uh, of this of this issue is that this court absolutely can correct an incorrect ruling of law by the trial court as it pertains to the validity of a defense or the validity of an element of a defense that serves as the basis for compelling financial records. And this court getting has an argument with that, by the way. Okay, okay. Our, our debate was <laughs> if the trial court had discretion to do something, how can we overturn discretionary court? Oh, discretionary. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Um, regarding joint enterprise. Um, that theory was not was not argued in the proceedings below as a basis to compel the records. Joint enterprise, um, that the law is clear in that on that uh, defense as well is that it, it can only be used in the third party context uh, as a defense if it's still even a viable defense in, in auto negligence claims. I know it's used in the catamaran um, instance, but in auto negligence, it's it's pragmatically uh, difficult to to see how a passenger could have joint control over the vehicle, but be that as it may, the public policy implications from imputing a tortfeasor's negligence onto the person they hurt have been discredited for, for over half a century. Um, in Rawlson v. Hicks in North Carolina, it, it would have offend justice and right to impute the negligence of a servant to his master and thus exempt him from the consequences of his own, of his own wrongdoing. Hale v. Adams, uh, the first DCA in 1960. A defendant should not be permitted to defeat an action on the ground that he was guilty of wrongdoing. That's exactly what they're trying to do in this instance. Um, and that has been uh, rejected for, for over half a century. Um, yes. It seems to me as a misalignment. The lower court judge may well find that these records are pertinent to a joint enterprise, joint venture. I have yet to see why that matters. Why does that have to do with anything? <laughs> That's the, yeah, I'm an old insurance lawyer, so I'm a, reaching back, but I don't, I don't understand. A, a joint enterprise, you're right. A joint enterprise is a non-business venture. A joint enterprise factually wouldn't even implicate banking records. And I think the argument they stated in, in the response was, well, it may, it may tend to show that, that the joint enterprise defense doesn't apply. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, re regarding joint venture, you know, factually, the banking records, even accepting it as a defense, the, has five very specific elements, uh, none of which could be proved by, by Mr. Bailey's or Mr. Raines' banking records. Um, we don't even know what the net... There's an element, for instance, of joint proprietary interest in the subject matter of the venture. It was undisputed in this case that Mr. Bailey solely owned the truck. That was, that was the only asset of, of the trucking venture. 
was, was the truck. Yeah, undisputed, he solely owned it. That in and of itself destroys factually. No, the, the, the asset, there's a tangible assets that are obtained in drugs. That's, that's labor. <laughs> That's labor. The, the, the asset of the venture is, is what, are, what, are its, what are its tangible assets? It's the, there's the truck. There's with the policy of insurance, potentially, but that was solely paid for by Mr. Bailey. He was the sole named insured. Um, the, uh, and, and it would be impossible, impossible to determine what entries could, could even be relevant to, to the ability to share in profits. There wasn't even evidence as to what the profits of the company were. Um, the, the respondents didn't produce their own decedent's banking records in this case, which is baffling since they're the ones that put this arguable, you know, relevant issue at issue of, of joint venture, and they wouldn't even produce their own banking records to, to reflect any payments between the two decedents, which, by the way, but the court did make an oral ruling at one of the hearings requesting if either of you have any information, either banking records that show payment from one decedent to the other, I want, I want you to disclose that in 10 days. We, we responded to that and said, there are none. <clears throat> and that has never been disputed. Uh, that, was, that was not addressed in, in the courts in camera review. Um, You're out of time. I hope thank you. you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. All rise.